Now, in New England, we've got other things going on besides the English church, besides the, the established church of England. We've got uh, dissenters, and we've got congregationalists, and we've got Baptists, and we've got everybody, and they're all having slightly different churches being built, uh, and in some, time, some cases to different plans. This is Hingham, Mass. in 1680, and this is a, a preaching uh, church, a Puritan church, uh, but it's the same basic idea of a window and a pulpit as the center, but the center is against the long side, so you've got uh, pews all around facing the pulpit in a gathering, so it's a sort of semicircle rather than the linear, everybody's looking this way, and when the sermon's going on, you're sort of looking to the angle, but you're still looking straight ahead, and then the center of the, of the church is the, uh, is the altar. And you've got non um, churches that don't have ceremonies and don't want any of that stuff. The Quakers, of course, with their simple meeting rooms with no decoration and no real lit liturgy happening, just the, uh, the meeting, the silence of the meeting. And you've got the Shakers who had their, their um, originally have their dancing, but they give up the dancing as they get too old for everybody to dance. And they say, if, no, if not everybody can dance, then nobody should dance. And so you, you get uh, more like Shaker meeting after the, F Quaker meeting after they, they've given up the, the dancing. And their, the simplicity of their interiors makes no distinction between the secular and the sacred, uh, because everything is sacred. St. Benedict said in his rules that you should treat the utensils of the kitchen with the same reverence you treat the utensils of the altar. And the only people who actually take that seriously are the shakers, where they do treat everything the same, with the same reverence, the hands to work and hearts to God, and create these wonderful spaces. But this is our more typical chapel that we have uh, and that you have several examples of here. This is the South Waldo Methodist of 1855. I love the fact that you have two basic church building clusters. You've got the old German, but then in 1850s, you're building a whole lot of churches right near each other. And then in the 1880s, you do the same thing. So you've got sort of two uh, uh, bursts of creativity. And this has the two doors and the two aisles. And uh, in the liturgical churches that want to have processions down the middle, things like bridal processions, you have one aisle. So it was um, interesting to uh, com come and see a whole sort of clutch of churches that have the two aisle idea and sent me to the, the web. And I found a wonderful description of why churches have two aisles dating from the Isle of Man the small island between Ireland and England and describing the Methodist chapels of the Isle of Man. And he's, he's nailed it. So I'm going to share that with you here. And it's a long one, but it's, it's, you'll see it's every point he makes is uh, relevant to the issue of how we think about church and how we especially think about aisles in churches. It says, the early layouts were inclined toward a two-aisle design, one on each side of the building. The entrance in the gable and, and by a by a central door and then with high back rear pews forming a screen so that you got to the two aisles or by frankly having two doors to the outside. And we have examples of both. Um, the, this arrangement followed logically and was determined by the segregation of sex requirements, the male section being provided with wooden pegs on which Puritan top hats of the men were hung. So there would be men on one side and women on the other side with the center with a, having a sort of bundling board down between to keep the two apart, but the aisles being separate. Its straight-backed, uh, uncomfortable box pews were deliberately constructed to discourage drowsiness and lack of attention by the congregation. The whole purpose behind chapel design was to facilitate worship and certainly, quote, not to ascend to heaven on flowery beds of ease. This singleness, this singleness of purpose ruled out any need to provide for pageantry or outward show. Symbols and imagery were considered indicative of priesthood, popery, and conformity. These would have been a complete negation of stout Protestantism. 
No altars were required, and to erect one would have been tantamount to a denial of basic doctrine, the fervent adherence to a belief in the complete and spontaneous direct access of man to the divine without the indirect intercession of a priestly intermediary. The supreme sacrifice of Christ must not be challenged by an artificial altar of man's creation. Thus, the architectural design was dictated by the doctrinal beliefs of the builders. Even the communion rail was not apparent in many of the early chapels. The more recent designs included the provision of a box pulpit, but the earlier examples, especially the primitive Methodists, were spacious, allowing for the fervor and movement of the preachers who needed the maximum sto scope for their unrestricted impulses. Just as I'm sort of chained to the pulpit by this, I would normally be pacing the floor here, doing gestures towards the screen in the same way as the... And, uh, Music was vocal only, instruments viewed with suspicion as being an invention of the devil. Thus, the early interiors did not provide a specially planned alcove or recess for a harmonium. These were a later innovation, and even at the present time are found placed in very nondescript corners. Later, organ installation showed a mellowing of attitudes and corresponded with the introduction of choir stalls, which sometimes became status symbols. So that's your double aisle church. And of course, many of the ones that you have here are double aisle, though not all. So this is South Walderboro. Uh, the steeple blown off by a gale, and in 1909, the bell tower were added. So you see a church that originally, it says, had a steeple, but when that was blown off, then you, they put in the bell tower and the, sp the spire with the shingled side from 1909, because by 1909, we're not building these uh, traditional churches were building shingled churches and so the towers get to be shingled and you can tell that from some of the others. North Walderboro, 1843. The tower was added in 1898 and the church was built in 1843 where it has pointed windows. It's actually got gothic windows on the sides but it probably what happened is in the remodeling in 1898 the whole facade was changed. Maybe these doors survived and one was pushed out to the face of the tower, but this arch is almost certainly a shingled arch from the 1890s, and you can sort of read that when you look at the buildings. And a more thorough and earlier model is the old North Church in 1820, uh, again with the spire, a simple spire, removed uh, and replaced by a bell tower, with, which is much more elaborate than the church it sits on. And this has that classic Roman temple design of the, uh, of the gable window facing the front, gabled uh, facade. And the, the village Methodist, uh, which is on its third bell tower, uh, has the, the uh, columns in antis feature of having a solid sides and then a recessed entry for the door with two freestanding columns to specifically proclaim its adherence to this notion of the temple front. This is the fewest columns you can have and still call yourself a temple. And that's what these, this church design is looking for. And there's the spire on top of the bell tower going up. And another picture of the trees. And then this, which is very much like what you have here, except uh, the organ is in the alcove. I like the idea that in this one you have the two most famous paintings of Christ in, in uh, the world, uh, versions of those, which are the Holman Hunt's The Light of the World, Knocking at the Door, and the Christ in the Garden by Heinrich Hoffmann. Not, the, not good copies. I mean, they're, they're different. They're, um, they've changed the pose, but clearly based on having those as their touchstones. 